Um, welcome to the grand finale, which is where we wrap up with the recommendations that you have already been discussing and making in the breakout groups this afternoon. So as somebody said to me over the coffee break, the work, the hard work is done. Not necessarily for our panelists who are not going to be discussing them, they are actually going to be telling everybody in the room what the recommendations for their individual breakout group have been. And these recommendations will then be forwarded on in our official closing ceremony uh, to the conveners or the overseers, if you like, of the next W20. So that will be the official close. And you may see um, we have a session or at least an item on the agenda here, which is called Next Steps. I'll let you into a secret. Next Steps is going to be the reception, okay? So <laughs> if, that's, the, that's the big, big grand finale. And that's when all the discussions can continue. I hope you'll stay on for that. And um, I hope our presenters here, our facilitators, will agree that if people don't particularly like the wording of one or other recommendation, you might be open to, um, how should we say, a small um, addendum to your recommendations. <laughs> right, so we'll go in the order of the group. So I believe, uh, what was the first group? It's uh, Demo first. And if you could just remind everybody in the room what the title and theme was, then that would help. Thank you. Well, thank you, Claire. Uh, do I need to introduce myself? Um, we can give your name and the name is... The, the Demet Ozdemir, I'll do it yes. briefly. Uh, Demet Ozdemir, I'm from EY. Uh, Ernst & Young. See, I'm a transaction partner, so advising clients in uh, buying and selling their shares. And I'm also the sponsor lead for Entrepreneur Winning Woman program in EY that covers Europe, Middle East, India, and Africa. And, uh, and I had the opportunity to co-chaired the Women Entrepreneurship at the W20 at the first uh, time when W20 was launched under G20 Turkey presidency. And this time I also uh, moderated the Women Entrepreneurship panel, the, or not the panel, but the breakout session. And thanks to all the contributors uh, who have been with us in that breakout session because it has been a really lively, engaging and insightful discussion. So for me, it has been a bit uh, difficult, maybe to summarize recommendations. Uh, we have a lot of recommendations. I just <laughs> tried to summarize into 10. <laughs> I know I need to prioritize on to five, but I couldn't <laughs> limit it. All right. Um, to start with the first and second, I would say. Establish the governance which holds G20, W20 accountable for gender advancement, including clear incentives and penalties, as well as gender-specific data gathering and monitoring. Going to this um, next one. Establish a community of knowledge to enable easy access to education, best practice, and knowledge. And the next one. Enable women entrepreneurs with digital capabilities and resources early on, beginning of their growth journey. Incorporating ESG factors into rating process, e.g. gender gap, gender index. Creating new business models that are gender responsible in countries or businesses where they do not exist. Shift the dialogue in strategic partnerships towards innovation aligned to the core business or the function of the company, not just CSR. Once successful model is identified, work and share with local partners to scale and success. Coming to the last two points. A ensure there's funds allocated specifically with gender lens investing. Last but not least one, enlarging the community, including more men. Thank you. Right, does anyone in that group feel there was anything missing? Otherwise, we're going to move swiftly on. I believe these will all be captured, typed up, available for future discussions. So this is not the last word on these recommendations. So over to the second group, which is shaping the new world of work, Heidi. Heidi Bauman. Yes, hi, I'm Heidi Bauman. Um, I'm a member of the council at Chatham House. I'm also a PhD researcher on gendered narratives at Cambridge, and I'm a media and tech executive. 
um, and my group um, broke this down into four different question sets. Um, uh, uh, one was um, suggestions for flexible working arrangements for men and women. Secondly, how to develop new skills for women in the workplace. Uh, number three, effective interventions to counter gender bias, prejudice, stereotyping, and sexual harassment. And last but not least, um, number four, how to design a work environment uh, also with equipment with women in mind. And so the recommendations we came up with um, on flexible working arrangements were that we need a clear definition of working hours, not just a totality of hours, but how they could be spread out and broken down, with clear boundaries to people's uh, private lives to ensure well-being and mental health, um, that it was important to set mutual expectations between employer and employee in that regard. Um, another topic was part-time work, and the, requirement, the recommendation there was that uh, we should look at phased retirement, um, and also that senior men should uh, show and role model that um, flexible working can actually be done, mm -hmm. and that men can take paternity leave too. Um, um, another at last recommendation on this topic was um, to introduce work uh, areas to the local community so that uh, more girls and women could get a feel for what a particular profession looks like. Um, and and uh, just a remark um, on, on the old frames of reference on terms of what flexible working even means. Flexible working is potentially a meaningless term for the next generation because they think quite differently in terms of temporality and in terms of showing up to a physical um, site. Um, so then next on the skills, um, how do you get women equipped with the right skills? Um, the recommendation was there to do women-only trainings in male topics such as coding. Uh, secondly then, um, to form more professional, uh, female professional bodies um, to help skills development and also with networking. Um, thirdly then, to broaden the skills in adjacent and incremental skill sets. Um, and lastly, um, for senior managers to do pro bono work uh, and mentoring for the young and for the companies to, to uh, pay for that and to also do reverse mentoring with the young. Number three then, um, interventions to help with um, prejudice, stereotyping, etc., cetera, um, is to protect women not just in physical uh, buildings but um, everywhere. They're traveling to work after work hours uh, working in another site or, or some such, um, to very explicitly define what sexual harassment means um, and link that very closely to legislation in each country. Um, that point was then also made, number three, the recommendation was that both men and women need training. Um, and lastly, we need to look beyond formal skills, um, such as uh, it was alluded earlier, I think, by Marta, uh, uh, Lane Fox um, problem solving, not C++ skills. And lastly then on the work environment, um, uh, we need policies for all, not just for women, uh, was a recommendation. And another recommendation then was um, daycare arrangements to, for children and elderly, a very important factor. Um, sometimes overlooked is that also work gear needs to be designed with women in mind because protective shoes or even a, a, a bulletproof vest for a female police officer might have to look quite different. Um, and very lastly, um, inclusion needs to become an everyday conversation topic. Mm. Good, thank you very much. Now, anyone with an instant response? Oh, make it quick. Sorry, there's a mic coming, I think. Uh, ILO just, and all the member states and the tripartite ILO just ratified an extraordinary treaty that's been negotiated over the last five years. Just now, three weeks ago, it deals with a number of the things that you've touched upon, not all. And I would suggest that you look into it and make your recommendation that all the G20 countries ratify it. Okay, good. If you can square the recommendations, that's a good point. Thank you very much. 
Okay, the next group is Harnessing Technology, and it's over to you, Dorothy, Dorothy Gordon. This was a very <laughs> exciting conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the discussions reflect the tensions that we see generally today, um, concerns about tech, concerns about how our data is being used, and then the fact that our entire future is going to anchor onto technology. And so the first thing that we want to say, I think the group uh, was quite unified on this, is that the entire communicate should reflect digital. So in all of your summaries, we have to have the digital dimension. We do not want a separate paragraph on digital. So we have a very ambitious agenda uh, because we see a huge opportunity for tech for good. But at the moment, we are not seeing financing for tech for good in any kind of systematic way. So there are some quite controversial recommendations. Uh, let me start with those so that you can sort of absorb them. So there's a proposal that we should have some cl clear criteria for our expectations from responsible, what would be responsible tech. And that it should be possible to put a tax or penalty on companies that then could be used to fund innovation that would be tech for good. This is for me quite a controversial recommendation. I'm not sure if it will go down. So let me continue with the less controversial bits. So definitely closing the gender gaps. Um, there are gaps that remain in access, very important for especially those women who are just now joining uh, the digital space. Skills, skills remain an issue and skills um, create special vulnerabilities for women. So women are more vulnerable to fraud online because it's perceived that they don't have the skills to be able to determine that they're being defrauded. So we want a special emphasis on um, skills to do with finance, skills to do with safety and security online, and understanding how data is being used. Skills also reflects to the STEAM uh, orientation that we already had in the previous communique. And I should have said at the beginning that we feel that in opening, uh, we should link in to some of the work that's been done at uh, W20 already, as well as the Secretary General's high level panel on digital. So um, th that's very important. And what we are hoping to see is for the other 20 communities, you know, B20, et cetera, that we'll be able to see some of these elements being incorporated into it. Huge opportunities for women in business when it comes to tech. So um, a lot of discussion about how we can train women to become more engaged in e-commerce. And then also this idea of having specific funds designated for women innovators that um, what we're seeing now, as we discussed in the earlier session, 2% of venture capital goes to women and want to see how we can, by um, earmarking specific funds for women, uh, improve that statistic. We have huge opportunities for delivering value, um, but this will depend on an improved governance of technology at the global level and defining those clear criteria for monitoring the social impact of tech. Um, we also discussed the possibility of people paying for services that are currently free, which would give them an opt out. So that means that if you don't want to uh, have your data shared, you could actually opt out of a particular solution or a particular um, uh, app and say, I want my data to be controlled by me. And then 
one of the important issues that we've been discussing is the bias that we see in tech against women. Um, whether it is inbuilt into the algorithm, and we had a very interesting explanation about how algorithms can be made more transparent without destroying business models. And I think, so we are talking about neutral by design, how do you achieve that? And then also training from a very early age so that people would understand how bias happens and how bias can be avoided. And I think I'll leave it there and I'm sure there should be some contributions from the group because we had a very active and engaged group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Right, anyone got any particular point? I think the main point is the one you said at the beginning, which it has to not be treated as a separate topic, but sort of migrate through the whole document. Yes, I'll come to you. And the second thing is it has to refer back to things that have already happened so that there is a sense of continuity that we're not asking for yes, these things and, cold. And what I also forgot to yeah. say is that our group said some of these things should be time bound mm. so that we will be able to measure progress. Okay. We, can't, we can't keep saying the same things over and over again. Okay, so impact and monitoring. Yes. Yes. Eagle, I wasn't in the group, but I was in the group talking about gender lens investing and investing in women entrepreneurs. And I just wonder, because we artificially separated out even though we're so connected. Um, I host a summit called the Gender Smart Investing Summit, and we did a session on what is investors' responsibility and opportunity to make sure that we're following the things that you just said in our role as investors to make sure that um, the companies we're investing in, the way we're using our capital, is promoting the things that you're describing and not unintentionally backing tech that is not good for women, but consciously backing tech that is all the things that you're talking about. And so I think connecting the dots is a very important piece of this puzzle because investors who are placing the capital can bear so much influence on being part of that solution in partnership with the things you're talking about. Yeah, good. Let, let me yeah. say that yeah. we, we were looking at governments spearheading this and attracting private investors into it. But the recommendations are as much for the private sector and civil society as they are government. uh, governments, so that's very appropriate. Thank you. Right, last but very much not least, Elizabeth, introduce Hi. your topic. <laughs> Our topic is investing in the silver economy. I'm Elizabeth Isop, better known as a bold old woman. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> we had a fabulous, dynamic uh, session, and it was a highly engaged group of individuals that represented an incredible cross-sector of society, from government, education, policy, research, technology, private sector, employers, you name it, there was an individual at the table for whom we could tap into their brain power. But even more critical than the cross-sector, it was cross-generational. The people in our workshop ranged in age from the youngest was 14, and uh, I think I was the oldest, but I've already covered that. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the most important things that came out, and this is both from the younger people and the older people in the room, that we need to break these silos. We need to create outreach between <coughs> the generations so that there's more common understanding. Because once we start asking questions of each generation, it's astounding how common their interests and their needs are, particularly in relation to work. It's not just the senior population that wants meaningful, purposeful work, it's the younger population as well. And uh, the more we can work with and across generations, in fact, one of the people in our room who shall remain nameless got very excited when she learned she could have a young tutor. <laughs> so it's, um, it's, it, there's all kind of positive benefits from this. But one of the key things that came out uh, and was really the driving factor in my putting together the panel and sort of seating the people around the table to get these different mindsets in the room is that we should stop measuring aging chronologically. If we measure it chronologically, we're looking backwards. And the chronological measurement of age is so 
out of context in terms of an aging individual, because the aging individual is defined more by their characteristics, which are their characteristics and their potential, which, because we have to think that chronologically, we used to define people as old or go into pensions when they're 60, 65, in some countries much earlier than that. But we now have this period of longevity, which is an incredible opportunity, both for individuals and society. So we have to start measuring the potential of these individuals based on their characteristics instead of their chronological age, because you have a chronologically aged person in Japan who is far different than one in Bulgaria, who is far different from someone age 60 in the United States. So you cannot, we cannot keep putting this artificial construct on age. And it ties right into the fact that another practical thing that we have to do about aging is to redefine the pension system. The pension systems are based on that false arbitrator of age, chronological age. So you're entitled to pension, you're entitled to a bus discount, a train discount, you're entitled to all kinds of discounts once you reach the age of 50. And 50-year-olds now may not need those entitlements, may, may not need their pension right now. More people over age 50 are continuing to work, starting their own businesses, and contributing to taxes with their tax money. And so the pension programs, regardless of all the people you hear that say that they, you know society is going to be devastated by the silver tsunami, I say it's a silver lining and we need to optimize the talent of these individuals, optimize the talent and the creativity of the individuals. And the creativity came out around the table in the room in terms of all different things that we should be doing to really change this negative paradigm. And one of the overall things that came out is that we should listen. We should listen to people over 50 instead of saying, well, I think they should have this, or they should have that, or they should have this opportunity. Ask them what they want. Do they want to continue working? Do they want to stop working? Do they want to work part time? Do they want to start their own business? How many of us in this room have stopped to ask somebody over 50 what they really want? Half the time we're looking at people and thinking, <gasps> How am I going to meet this person's needs? Well, how about if you flip that around and figured out how that person is going to meet your needs? So we need to have this kind of role reversal in that capacity. Another thing uh, that's critically important is everybody thinks that this is such a huge topic. And it is a huge topic. But as one person in the room said, change begins with change. So you have to start change. And you can scale it up. But the best change happens at a grassroots level. So it's particular to someone's community. It's particular to someone's family. It's particular to someone's background and what they want to do with their life. So think in terms of grassroots, community level change. And it will happen. And you can do it. So it's not quite so overwhelming. And you can push the tsunami back, because it's, it's, it's not a tsunami, as I said. The other thing uh, that came up and is key, and I guess an overriding principle as well in terms of education, uh, educating both young people and older people of the value they bring into the room. How do we change education so that people stop looking at aging as decrepit and dependent? And how do older people start looking at the younger generations as tech heads and you know, pierced every which way? So you have to get these people talking with one another. You can only get them talking. They will only change their perceptions if they start communicating with one another. So we have to open these educations, because if someone, like these fabulous pictures we've seen in women from Getty, um, and I'm thrilled to say that that woman said she, her next project is uh, aging, all the different faces of aging. And if we see pictures of aging individuals as dynamic as the women in Chatham House today, the women in this room, as well as the pictures, we will have a different perception. So it's not self-fulfilling. If we see someone old and decrepit and walking with a cane and you know, needing help and assistance or at the hospital, which are the prevailing media images, that's going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we don't have to let that happen. The second part of education is 
in terms of the whole workforce development and universities, and we have to have more partnerships between universities and education systems and the workforce system. Because right now for colleges, and this is particularly, I'm not sure how much in the UK, but in the United States, Lots of colleges and universities are getting, they're prohibitively expensive, half of them are going out of business, and so they're depending on the older population, bringing them back into the colleges and universities. But what are they teaching them? You know, opera, classical art, art history, <laughs> knitting, uh, it's just <laughs> mind-boggling. And I, I don't, uh, well, I won't go into what I want to study there, but at any rate, <laughs> What they should be doing is, because the unemployment level is so low in the United States, and combined with the low birth rate, there's not enough people coming into the workforce. So if the education college system and community college system begin talking to employers, what do you need? And designing courses for what those employer needs are, then these individuals coming into the college system are not just studying fine arts or literature or something. There's, they can do that, but they can also get practical education. So right now we have this huge untapped resource in the individuals who have been retired, most of them because they didn't want to retire or just automatically retired because of that chronological age, which is gonna come back to haunt us all. And the other thing was, and it's not just uh, the education systems. There was one woman in the room, and I'm not sure if she's still here, who was talking about her work with the Ministry of Defense. And, and the same thing in the United States with veterans. Veterans tend to retire from military very, very, or much earlier than you know any kind of corporate structure. So they may have another 40 years ahead of them. So how do we place those individuals in employment situations which are comfortable and meet their financial needs. And the same thing when we turn to the young people in the room and we ask them what they want out of their employment. And again, it goes back to asking people what they want. It was just extraordinary how close their needs and desires for work and purpose were. It was just absolutely brilliant. And I think, um, the note I would like to close on, and we can't exactly present this as a principle, but my favorite quote of all time is, and it's particularly applicable to Chatham House, this institution of ideas. George Bernard Shaw said, we do not stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing with ideas. So I thank Chatham House, I thank my incredible panel in the room, and I'm sure they're all outspoken enough that they're gonna tell me what I left out, so I will close on that note. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Right. Thank you. Well, I think you, as a member of that group, you captured the essence wonderfully, but I can think of one or two things that are missing. So if anyone feels really strongly about it, if not, we will add them in at a later stage. So. Okay, so is everyone happy? Nobody wants to object or add more things? Oh, um, yes, please do. Uh, yes. Um, just helping people to understand that they can have a midlife refuel mm. and that they can get their hormones into an optimum range and their nutrients, which will fuel yeah. their brain Absolutely. so they don't have brain fog and anxiety and aches and pains and fatigue and all of that and get turbocharged so that they can really enjoy the next part of their journey and be productive in the workplace. So we're gonna recommend that's free, you know, provided by every government, you know, well, as a requirement. Well, it's in the medical journals, so we can live in hopes. Well, we could all get a dose of uh, our pensions early for the midlife refueling that will be paid back. <laughs> Absolutely, you'll pay it back very quickly, won't you? <laughs> yeah. um, could I just suggest that you mention explicitly digital skills? I mentioned that, yeah. I had something, I'll tell you about it. Mm. Don't worry, I was she, doing it. Um, yes, one of our, our uh, panelists, uh, thank you, because that's one of my favorite subjects, because people always say that older people, you know, can't stand technology or are fearful of technology. In my experience, and one of the first businesses I started was Cyber Seniors, where we taught seniors how to use technology. And the people that came into that room, it was, it was an intergenerational program 
where young people would help seniors learn technology skills and learn how to find what they wanted on the internet. And um, those seniors who we would have people, we started the class for people age 50 and it went up to age 95. And those people came in and were so excited because they had felt, talk about the digital divide, they had been incredibly cut off. And somebody came in and somebody once wrote an article about it and said, oh, they just want to talk to their grandchildren. And I said, ah, that's one of the last things they want to do. <laughs> and, but to show you how cut off they were, uh, at the beginning of each class, much as I did with the workshop today, I asked people why they were coming. And this uh, elderly gentleman, and I'm sure he was almost 90, uh, started his conversation, well, when I was standing in the bathroom, this why everybody's, oh my word. <laughs> and, uh, but it was so touching, and he said, I looked down at my toothbrush, and it said www.colgate.com, and I didn't know what that means, so I came into this workshop. And that's, that's how separated they were, and, and seniors, love the technology. They're the most active audience on Facebook. And um, the other thing I'm proposing in another project that I work on in terms of artificial intelligence, one of the biggest things is unlocking the black box and getting rid of this you know, bias. And I said, the young people know the technology, but they don't know the questions to ask if it's biased. But you have someone with 50, 60 years of life experience. They know bias. And, they, and it's not just age bias. And I said, who better? to be guardians of this artificial intelligence. They don't have to know the technology, but they know the questions to ask so we can make the artificial intelligence and machine learning unbiased and restore public trust in it. I mean, it's talk about an untapped resource. The artificial intelligence is a whole other category. Sorry, you opened that. <laughs> oh, no, we've got lots to say. I think you're, you're, you're proving the point that digital is going to run across this. It's yeah. a question of how you you know, it, it capture it, yeah. uh, but I'm sure we can and manage that. Way, I, I, um, I had, as one of the potential areas for discussion, yeah. the, what does is, what is robotics and AI do to, fu to the future of skills? But then I knew you were running your session, yeah. so we, no, we, no, we no, focused no, on some other things. We want it to be, we want yeah. it to appear. Yeah. Um, there was one thing I missed, if you don't mind. Um, there were some concerns expressed about how government is implementing technology. And um, it was very interesting to find out that the third party outsourcing at the local government level that exposes citizen data um, is quite prevalent. Oh, right. And nobody really knows how those contracts are being managed, whether the software that's been commissioned belongs to local government or it's gone out. So there are many issues around the transparency of contracting yeah. uh, for government solutions, mm -hmm. uh, citizen solutions, because we have no opt out there. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to a government software, we will have to use it as citizens. So how that is designed and managed is also something that the group discussed. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, you may leave the platform now. We're going to have the official <laughs> session. So thank you very much. While they're taking their seats again, can I ask the convener of the 2019 Gender and Growth Forum, uh, Policy Forum, Shaping the Future We Want, namely Stéphane Dubois, to join me on the stage? Do you have a microphone? I've made sure everybody had these guys, but I haven't got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, first of all, I'm going to say thank you to everybody. I think uh, you've done an enormous amount of work, and it's more than it, and the amount. It's the quality of the work. And uh, now uh, that we have these recommendations, I can turn to the W20 in Saudi Arabia and say, now you do the work. <laughs> so I would ask my, my colleague from uh, the head of delegation of Saudi Arabia to join me on stage as I am going to present to her. You see how quick we are.
recommendations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's a big job. It's a, it's, she now has an enormous job uh, to get everybody to agree because the basis for the approval of the communique, and we've got a few delegates that are here, is consensus. So you can imagine. So uh, look forward to seeing Thank you. You, you, can, you can ask you. you. You're all ready to work with her, aren't you? <laughs> yeah? Perfect. Thank okay, you. excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, before we go away and follow the next steps and go and have a drink, uh, I'd like to just take a few minutes to um, just say a few thank yous. I mean, we've been doing this now for five years. Four years, sorry. Five years. Ago. Four years, and um, these wouldn't happen. The forum wouldn't happen if we had, didn't have the support from its intellectual support, its financial support, its, it all is very important for us. And I would like to thank the sponsors. I'm gonna talk about EY because EY has been with us since the beginning, so since 2015, the creation of the, um, of the um, what is it called, the Gender and Growth Initiative. <laughs> and, and um, but you know, if I say the name of the company, it's not a company, it's a company, but it's individuals. So I would like to definitely uh, underline the, the support of uh, Julie Teigland over the years. Um, we've got uh, Rebecca Hill. Rebecca, are you there? Right. Rebecca, there was uh, Gemma Williams and Natasha. Now these, you've gone to other adventures, but you were there for a several number of years. We've got Charlotte, we've got Alison, and there's also Mariana, who is in uh, Argentina, Karen, who was with us this year. So all these people, thank you so much for your help. And then we have all the other sponsors. We've got MasterCard, and that MasterCard is Anne Kearns and Sam. So thank you very much. We've got um, Getty. You met Rebecca yesterday. It was a pleasure working with her when I said, do you think we could have an exhibition? And she just, of course. <laughs> and she just made it happen. It was wonderful. Um, the Asia Foundation has been with us also since the beginning and helping us bring people to London, so that was fantastic. And uh, the Freedom Fund uh, decided this year to support and bring the notion of leadership in the Global South uh, to, to the Forum, and I'm really grateful because I think we need to have not just what's happening in London, but what's happening around the world. So I'm really grateful for that. I'm sure I'm gonna forget somebody. Of course, McKinsey. <laughs> we had uh, Vivian Hunt. And um, the Asia Foundation, okay, fine. Um, so we had, just so that you know, we had in the past day and a half, over 60 speakers, panelists, and uh, facilitators that took part in this. And I want to thank them with my heart. It's been extraordinary. You've done a super job. You almost kept the timings, so that was great. <laughs> And I've got two minutes to finish now. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it goes beyond the speakers, panelists, and blah, blah, blah. It's also the participants, because the participants, you were there working on the recommendations. And these are really important. Saudi Arabia will tell you now. Um, you know I've got colleagues huh? um, at, at Chatham House and the Gender and Growth Initiative. We don't really talk about them too much. But uh, I'd like to thank. Sarah Okoy, Sarah, don't leave. You always do that. Do not do. <laughs> Sarah has been my partner in crime for the past four years on this project. Okay. Go, adios, adios. There's also Roxanne. Roxanne has been helping us keep our head above board. Please get up, Roxanne. And just making sure that we knew who was coming to this event. So she's been keeping us in line, so thank you very much. Michaela, are you there? Michaela was drawn into this. She's a visiting fellow from Italy who never thought she'd be working on gender and growth. And uh, we've been actually having a great time having you around. And I would like to thank also uh, the, vo the volunteers who helped us during the forum this year and, and in previous year. Social media. For the past four years, we've had Donetta and her team and Kelly this year who've been tweeting and tweeting and tweeting <laughs> and making us trend 
on a number of occasions. So thank you very much, even spotting the trolls so we could stop them. Yes. <laughs> They have done a fabulous job, so, so let's, um, let's hope that we can lure them in coming in next year. Elizabeth, you've seen her there, but she's been preparing the text, she's been working with them during the two days, so you've been quite active these past days, so let's go and have dinner tonight, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Um, just one... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robin, Robin is a speaker. He's the director, but he was a speaker. I, I did include him. I didn't forget him. Okay. Um, oh, oh. Sorry. We had a live streamed event. I'm, I'm going to stop soon. I've, I've almost passed my time. So, live streamed event, uh, and that wouldn't happen with people doing it. So, we had in the booth over there, we had Stuart, we had Aaron, that you've seen some of you putting the, uh, the microphones and all that. And also Robin, who had to leave on holidays and is not with us right now. But Robin, they were all... The, the other Robin. The other Robin. Unless you want to start with microphones. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, God, I can't believe I've put so much on this piece of paper. I'm gonna, Susan! Susan Plunkett. She's been taking wonderful... Oh, there she is. Taking wonderful photographs. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, you've been with us for four years, too. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's great because it's like a family getting together again, isn't it? <laughs> so now I'm going to go on holidays, yeah. tell you the truth. <laughs> and believe it or not, believe it or not, I will be on my terrace in my little house in my village in Spain, and I will be listening to this, believe it or not. <laughs> Am I sick or what? Uh, but no, it was great. It was great to have you. And uh, I think the only thing I can say right now is à la prochaine. See you next year. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Hold on. Uh, maybe this microphone's working. Otherwise, I'm going to stand up and pick up that one. But um, of course, there's one person who wasn't thanked through all of this because you can't thank yourself, even in a list as long as that one. Um, when you open the second page, people got really worried, actually. But. Um, Stefan, a huge effort. We know how much time you've put into this, getting this group together, managing all of the uh, uh, panels, working out how the sessions would be handled, making sure everyone was followed up with. I got a phone call on Saturday, was taken through two different sessions, emails flying in the whole time. I think you all got that personal uh, uh, support. Getting this kind of a group together, make sure, uh, making sure it's substantive and not just a procession of speakers, takes a lot of effort. Uh, and I know you called out of your team, and I'd like to call them out on superb work, but you've been the motor behind this, substantively, logistically, and even laid up in traction, I think, at some point on the weekend. We won't go into that. You made it here and haven't even hobbled through the whole thing. So um, uh, a huge thanks to you. Could we please a very strong hand for Stefan? And, uh, and because we listen, because we listen to our council members, I know you all, the, uh, unbelievably finished at six o'clock, but it's amazing what drinks do for discipline. So the drinks are winning upstairs, but there's been a demand, including by a couple of our council members here as well, so I can't say no to them, for a team photo. And I said, what do you mean by team photo? I think they met one or two people. Actually, we're all here, you know, everyone's here. I think we should stage everyone up here. And Susan's gonna, this is, Let's get everyone up here. Let's get everyone up here. And then you can have a drink. But don't break any of the equipment. So...